type of Prosecco, a Canadian Prosecco. Should we it's cheers? Called Spitz. Del- cheers. cheers. It's quite delicious. I'm, I'm really trying to curb my appetite for daily drinking, but it's pretty friggin' hard. I mean, come on. Even out at the clubs we were drinking, I shouldn't say we, I was drinking at least five nights a week. So uh, things haven't changed that much. It's just we're home. <laughs> well, it just sounds like you're bragging about getting booked five times a week now. So oh, Really? <laughs> Look at you. Reminds me of is when you go to a photo booth and you're getting your picture taken, you should almost do it half. You know where you can choose like the two curtains or the half? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, this would be a terrible photo booth. Okay. Uh, now will be a good time for anybody that's listening. There's a lot of technical issues. If I speak, yada, yada, yada. Uh, oh, there's nothing we could do. I forgot about that. So is it you're here, you're half hearing me, half not? Really? Yeah. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's like your computer is passively, aggressively telling me that you're the star. Just shut up. <laughs> uh, live on Facebook, and you can only hear half of what I say. I'm supposed <laughs> on Facebook on Sunday so maybe this is going to be a disaster with my sound did you hear everything I just said there I did okay it's it really is just when I speak that (laughs) (laughs) didn't you know this is a zoom feature that I fixed (laughs) so that interviewers can't say too much actually uh it's for the best because uh, i tend to ramble but let's cut the shit okay so i'm gonna ask you a long question and then i'm gonna let you speak Sorry, I got And not interrupt. Okay. Tell me about your Zoom show last night. Oh, my schnitz. You know what? It was, first of all, I was really happy that we had a good crowd. We ended up getting 69 people. And I mean, it's it's a big shift from when I produce shows out in Almont or produce shows in Toronto even. Like I have, I can usually get at least 100 people out. Like if I don't get 100 people out, it's a little bit of a sad state because I'm only doing shows once every three months or so so I really work hard to get a ton of people I worked very hard on this show but you know the 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 climate has changed for obvious reasons and also there's just so many free events out there so um I was really happy we fought we ended up with a good crowd it was so bizarre being in my basement getting ready to go on stage like that was really it, it was it was nerve wracking because I didn't know how it was going to go. Even with all the tech possibilities, things can go wrong. But it ended up going very well. We had the intention of not uh, muting the audience, of leaving them unmuted. But again, with Zoom, there's this disaster of excuse me. If I'm sort of telling a joke and then people laugh, then you stop hearing what I'm saying. But I'm starting to think it might just be my computer. Maybe that's not just a Zoom. That's not a Zoom thing. It's just my computer's fucked up. Uh, no, that's a common complaint with Zoom calls. Like I've, and I think sometimes they can be like, uh, if you have too many people, people just aren't aware of their background noises too. So it's a whole hot debate. Um, Are you okay with me using the f bomb in here, or should I should I try not to swear? Uh, no, actually, I'm going to wrap this up if you swear one more time. <laughs> it's a family show. Uh, no, go off. Hey, check out what I uh, what I have. Oh, nice, and that's an. old and that's that's uh i've updated them since but that's fun is it the same info that was me doing some shameless self-promotion at one point i was actually uh thinking about that you're uh of all the headliners in ottawa like you you promote more than anybody i think i think that's really cool is that like uh i don't know like what goes into it how do you get 100 people to a show well i've got some secrets that i can't share with you I mean, no, I, I, I really think, um, well, I, I mean, I have been producing for a very long time and part of the impetus around producing was just, I find if you don't produce your own shows, there's not, there's not always a lot happening, I find, at least in Canada. I was talking to someone recently saying, like, there's so many versions of Canadian comics in the U.S. and if we were in the U.S., we'd be famous. But in Canada, it's just to get someone's career really shaking, I find you just, you have to do it yourself if you want anything to happen. So, I mean, I think one thing I do, one little thing I do, and I know it's a very American thing apparently, is I tend to say goodbye to my fans at the end of the show. And I say fans, I think the people who have come to see me in the show, they're fans because they're in the audience. And then I kind of, 
I like to connect with people after the show, and I find that makes a huge difference is just talking to people. People want a hug. They want a picture. That kind of thing is really great. And somehow getting their contact, that's huge, right? I have a mailing list of about uh, 3,000 people, and a lot of those people probably don't even want to be on there. But, you know, all you need, a lot of people say, you need like 2% of the population to love what you do and then work that, that group of people. So that's kind of... That's always been something that I, I've done. And when I used to do the fringe festivals and do one woman shows, you have to promote your show. There's like 150 other shows. And if you're not out flyering and telling people about your shows, <clears throat> you're not going to get anyone in your, in your audience and you're not going to make any money. In fact, you're going to lose money. So I think I got that also from being in the, on the fringe circuit for, I guess it's been like 15, no, almost 20 years that I've been doing the fringe circuit. And that's just a part of fringe culture promoting your show, having one line to sell that show, and getting strangers to come and take a risk on, on your $10 show. You did that uh, in New York, right? Like you, you got people to see your show. That was actually, that was tough. New York was tough. We did, I, I say we, I work with a musician. Uh, the show I did last night is called Shit, I'm in Love With You Again. And I work with a musician, Luke Jackson. He co-wrote the songs. So we did the show in Edinburgh. Someone saw it who has a theater in New York, Soho Theater Playhouse. So he brought us to New York, but we were exhausted from a month of doing Edinburgh. And then we were really supposed to promote the show. And uh, it's New York City. Like there's, I don't know how many hundreds of shows there are every night. So we just had a lot of trouble getting people out. So we almost had to um, get people to get in for free. And that, so it, it wasn't a big money maker, but it was awesome to just be off Broadway. And I know people who are quite famous who have gone there. There's a woman, Louisa, who does a show called uh, uh, What Would Beyonce Do? And she went to New York and her show kind of tanked a bit too. So I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> and people, more recognition. <laughs> you're allowed to laugh. You're like, uh, oh, I'm interrupt her with my laughter. <laughs> no, literally when I laugh, your audio cuts out. Does it? <sighs> so. I think I'm not funny for this entire interview. Yeah, you really got to turn it off. <laughs> Oh. <sighs> okay, um, let's uh, rewind a bit. When and where did you, I'm gonna try to get all my questions out in one chunk at a time, but when and where did you start doing stand-up? Let's go back to stand-up. Well, this is gonna age me a little, but I actually started in the 90s. So I graduated from theater school in like 94, and then I moved to Toronto. I fell in love with the person I'm married to right now, but I moved to Toronto and acting was a whole other, like how to get acting work was incredibly challenging at the time, for me at least. So I wanted some immediacy to, to, to get on stage and be able to, to be in front of an audience. So a friend of mine was doing stand-up, so I just, I, I've heard you talk to other guests, like you're talking to Dave Brennan about Einstein's and all those places. So I started in the 90s back when like even Joanna Downey had her room at Spirits, it was just beginning. Russell Peters was just starting to get really famous. There was a place called Comedy Wood, or, um, was it Comedy Wood? Yeah, on Bloor. But um, I started at that time in the 90s, and it was quite, you could get on TV quite quickly. There was a show called Adventures in uh, Comedy with LVR Kurt hosting. There was another show by Minnie Holmes uh, on the Women's Television Network. And so I did it. I started in 96, I think, and then I went until 2000, did stand up, got in the clubs, was starting to middle, got some TV appearances. And then I got pregnant and kind of everything sort of shifted. And I got out of stand-up and got on the fringe circuit doing one-woman shows. And then I got back into stand-up. I think it's been about 14 years now that I've been back in stand-up. And still doing one-woman shows. I always have a, have a conniption when I find out people did comedy on TV. What were the, the things you did? Like, did you do those ones you mentioned? And do you still have this, the, like the tapes? I do, actually. Yes, I have Mini Homes. Uh, and it's funny, I did a character on uh, the Mini Homes show. Uh, this character, Thuthan, that I originally tried in Yuck Yucks. The first time I did stand-up, it was at Yuck Yucks in Ottawa. And I went as a character. And Howard was the owner still. Back then, he started it. And I remember he said, come back when you're ready to be yourself. Excuse me. So I did that character on the women. In, uh, on Why am I not remembering this show? She's So Funny was the name of the show. So I did that character. And then I came back as a stand-up. And then on the... Uh, Kurt's show was more like they come to your house, they they interview you, and then 
it's almost like they film the audition and then you do a, a an appearance and so it's like a kind of a documentary in a way so i have i have both those appearances uh on tv yeah back oh. when i was 26 years old that's <laughs> cool you should um show them to me one day i'd like to see anytime i'll send you the link i have all my videos i i've taped my sets from like so long ago do you watch them like or did you i guess yeah i tend i still tape almost all my sets and i i am one of those losers that does watch them. i shouldn't say losers that's really diminishing my hard work but yes i do i watch them like you know really analyze them and try to look at what i did or didn't do and um yeah i only cringe at it because it's like the hardest part of comedy is watching yourself afterwards like but i think it is the right thing to do but i'd never want to do it you know what i've been doing it for so long i find what happened is I had so many fantastic sets and the camera fucked up. And I'm like, if I had just had my camera working, I wouldn't have missed that great set. And then I also had instances where I thought it was the shittiest set ever. And then I watched the video and I'm like, actually, it's not that bad. So it just has become a major habit. I know Martha Chavez does that too. She tapes every set, whether she watches everyone, I don't know, but it's just a habit now because you never know when you're going to have to showcase or someone randomly says, hey, do you have 10 minutes? Do you have, oh, maybe you were working on clean material that night and you end up filming it. And it's, it's just so valuable when you're beginning. It's incredibly important. And I remember when I first started comedy in the 90s, one of the handbooks that Howard gave to everybody when you went to the club was this list. And I still have that too. I'd be happy to publish that on Facebook. I think Howard has. But it, one of the things was tape every set with a recorder, whatever you have. That's the only way you're going to improve as a young comic. And I think I've, I've just carried it into to my time now. And now, like now that we're in freaking quarantine, it definitely has come in handy to have video and content to put out to people. Yeah, I was uh, creeping your YouTube channel. You've been posting a lot like in quarantine, right? Yeah, I even had something called the hot tub sessions, but we had to take it down. <laughs> Was it just too steamy? <laughs> no, it's just my husband uh, works at the hospital and uh, it was seen as unprofessional for a doctor to be. The first session we did, he was nude and you couldn't tell he was nude. I mean, we cropped out his penis. <laughs> but there was talk of like, you know, nudity in the tub and it was seen as unprofessional. And we talked about drugs and alcohol and all that. And that's your doctors never drink or do drugs. So. You know what I'm saying? Did he get like, like he got talked to at work for it? Yeah, I don't even know if I should be talking about this. I take it back, I take it back. Okay. The, this is the dirt. <laughs> it's a, uh, no, but so I love it. it. Sorry, we go love ahead. The trailer. There's a trailer still there, the hot tub sessions, but we had to take it down. So it was, it was a fun kind of quarantine project. I never thought I'd be working with my husband. I never thought I would, even have a little podcast. I've always wanted to. I watch Mike Ward a lot and I love, I love when you see that people can have podcasts and there's long periods of time where there's nothing interesting happening. They're just shooting the shit. So I just spent a lot of time in my hot tub at the beginning of quarantine and was having very interesting conversations with my husband. And I'm like, I got to film this shit. And I also learned a lot about editing with iMovie. So that was kind of exciting. And so I've, I enjoyed the process. That's cool. I, uh, I actually just learned how to edit. I made a <laughs> I made a short film for my birthday. Did you watch it? I didn't. I will now. I'm kidding. This is just a shameless plug for my short film. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, when you were uh, in Toronto, like, because I hear all like, and I, I lived in Toronto for a little bit. And there were like, like the open mics really sucked to do. Did you have a lot of like bad experiences? Oh, horrible. horrible. I always tell the story of my worst open mic experience. And I don't remember where it was. It was somewhere on, I think, uh, King Street and I think it was like one of those shows that's uh, like midnight but it ends up you're gonna be on at 1 30 in the morning and there was a guy who was like jacked out on coke and I remember I started doing comedy and he started he just started slowly getting on stage and telling jokes and being funny and I basically walked like I had to walk away because I just couldn't I couldn't do what he was doing I just couldn't be funny. Like, I wasn't experienced enough to even be able to handle the situation. Did he get laughs? Pardon? Did he get laughs? He did. 
Oh, yeah. Prince. Yeah. And I was also doing a lot of experimental clown bouffant work in Toronto. And I know I did. I did this September 11th parody. And it might have been too soon. And I came out as this real bimbo character like Pamela Anderson. And she was like, Osama Tsunami Part 4. And like reenacted the September 11th scene from a building, a burning building. And I'm like, oh my God, they're here. The terrorists are going to attack. And I jump out the window and I'm flying and my two friends are on fire and then I die. And, and then I say, oh, wasn't that the most amazing scene? Anyhow, it was, it was very risky. I have that on video. But my director, a woman heckled me and said, there's nothing funny about September 11th. And I said, this is satire. And if you don't get it, you can kiss my ass. And I walked off stage and my director came up and said, do you want to go out the back door? And I was like, no, we're going out the front door. But it was, I kind of wanted to go out the back door because I was so ashamed. Like I had bombed. And, and Zoe Rabnett was actually running that show at that time. So I always think she has all these memories of me and just doing these weird experimental things that sometimes bomb. Like when they were good, they were good. But that one, I did that that night and it was probably one of my biggest bombs ever. And the whole audience was like, what an asshole to have done this. That's so funny <laughs> uh, to bomb in front of Zoe. I had a, a job interview with her actually. And I just hope if I ever like showcase for just for laughs that she's forgotten me because I made so many jokes in the interview and it was like a real job, like a programming job. And I just ate shit just trying to be funny too hard for no reason. Um, what was your first, sorry? Was it for just for laughs, a programming job for just for laughs? Oh, okay. Did not get the job. <laughs> <laughs> You were too funny for it. That's what I told myself on the drive home. <laughs> uh, what was your uh, What was your first set like ever? Where was it? Um, I think my first set was actually. I think I said that my first set was in Ottawa Yuck Yucks, but I actually think it was at the Toronto Yuck Yucks in the basement club that now is Absolute Comedy, and I went in as a character. I was dressed as Susan the Psychic, and. Uh, I don't remember how it went, but I know that a guy approached me after the show and said, could I get a psychic reading from you? And I was like, listen, dude, like, this is a joke. I don't do psychic readings. And he's like, please, I'll buy you a drink. And I, I was broke. So I'm like, yeah, sure. So I did a psychic reading for him. And I was like, I'm really picturing the angels coming for you very soon. You're going to see the light. You know, I went totally went into this routine. And uh, I get a letter at Yuck Yucks the next week, and it says, To the Psychic. Thank you, you've changed my life. I think the guy actually got into prostitution, but I had somehow brought the light into his world through this psychic character. Wait, like you pushed him to prostitution, or you got him out of it? No, I, I sort of told him, I can't remember what I said, but I said something about, like, good news is coming, maybe you're going to get a job soon, and... And then when he wrote me back, it sounded like he might have found a job, but it didn't sound like a very good job. It sounded like he might have started uh, becoming a man of the evening. Well, I hear it's a lucrative business if you can get it. Yes, no judgment. That's true. No. <laughs> um, oh, my God, I just had a question. Okay, why did you, did you kind of start doing comedy because you wanted to be like an actress? Um, I actually have a BA in drama. And I also have a degree in acting from Langara College. So my, my goal was very much to become a serious actress. And that was my intention uh, for that seven years of education that I got. Um, I remember the last show I did at Studio 58 in Vancouver, I worked with some professional actresses who were older, who were like in their 60s. One of them was in her 40s. And they were these rock stars in acting. And then the, the show would finish and they'd be unemployed again. So I think my vision of being an actress changed very radically when I graduated because I realized I could do children's theater, I could tour, I could do shows, but I knew that it was a precarious business and that there was a really good chance I'd have to also do something like massage therapy or something other than acting if I wanted to act. And I had already modeled and I'd made really good money in high school modeling. I'd been a dancer, I had, done comedy and I knew and I was a visual artist too so when I moved to Toronto I wasn't ready to do Joe jobs like I was waitressing but I wasn't wanting to get a second career so I think I just thought okay well I was that kind of person like I'm gonna audition for a band like I met my my 
partner who I write comedy songs with because I auditioned for his Led Zeppelin band. And I got in the band and I'm like, okay, this is how I'm going to become famous. And then I was like, oh shit, you got to write songs and that's really hard. No, it wasn't a Led Zeppelin band, but that's, I did a Led Zeppelin song for that. So I, I was always searching for how am I going to get my talent recognized? And I think that I realized as an actress, I'm just, I also realized I was funny. Like I always got opportunities when I tried to do comedy. Like I auditioned for theater sports in Vancouver and I got on the main stage right away and I was acting with like very experienced improvisers. That kind of, I didn't get those opportunities in acting, but in comedy, I would like work with a clown, take a, te a class with this master teacher. And then I'm on stage at a gala in Edmonton being filmed by CBC. Like I got all these opportunities as a comedian that I never got as an actress. So I kind of had to face the news. And this came when I was in Toronto of having to face that I'm, I'm funny when I'm trying to be serious. So it's like, as much as I want to be a serious actress, I'm, I'm a freaking clown. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, that almost sucks. But tell what Edmonton Gala and CBC were you a clown? What is oh, your life? God, I didn't mean to get into this story, but it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a terrible true story. <laughs> I guess that's why we're here, eh? To tell stories. I find it look really tanned, but I'm not this tanned. Is my lighting horrible? Are you just trying to not tell the story? You don't have to tell me the story. <laughs> I can tell the story. Why not? It's a great story, actually. I was told by one of my theater school teachers that I was a clown. And I was like, what the heck's a clown? And I remember seeing this picture of this very funny looking woman. Her mouth was on the side and she had this crazy wig and it said clown class. So I signed up for this clown class and uh, I started working with this clown teacher and uh, she was a pretty wild and crazy clown. Like I remember she got hosed down by one of her neighbors once during a rehearsal and the rehearsal wouldn't go well and she'd go like let's do tequila shots or let's get stoned and then we would and then I would be a terrible partner to improvise with but long story short I went to the World Street Performers Festival in Edmonton and I did a gala performance with this clown and CBC filmed it and it was I remember that night this clown teacher said to me you're going to be a famous clown. Like she was like, this night has changed your life. Will change your life. Cause it was such an amazing, it was an amazing performance. And she had worked for Silk de Soleil. She'd had a lot of experience. But the next day, what we started doing is street performing. We started doing the same thing we did on stage in this gala on the street. And we did this routine with like whipped cream. And we were just covered in this goo at the end and working with another comedian, especially has like 30 years of experience on me it was a total disaster and cbc was documenting the whole thing and one performance where we were really pissed off at each other she walked off stage during the performance and i was left alone with an audience and having to kind of explain why my partner had walked off stage so that was kind of the end of our relationship and cbc filmed it they had to change the documentary to not include me so it was a very shameful kind of experience for me, but I was a young, stupid clown too. I thought I would do my one woman show at the time, which was about a drug addict brother and his sister. And I, I remember having a, a crowd of kids gathered to see my one woman show. And when I mimed do heroin, <laughs> all these kids and parents fucking scattered. And it was only then I realized, I don't think this is a kid friendly show. So I went home quite ashamed of myself. And then the Vancouver Comedy Festival came up in September and I went to see this clown who had hired me in Edmonton that we had had a falling out. I went to see her show and I was traumatized because she had taught, I had done my Susan character, my psychic character, that's kind of, it was developed in her workshop and uh, she had taught someone my routine that we had done together and he did it on stage at the Comedy Festival in Vancouver and completely stole my routine and did it in front of this like packed crowd at the comedy festival so that was when i basically said i'm never going to do clown again and um so i can't oh that was so that was my terrible uh beginning as a clown story that's so that's so wild you were like in the clown community i was i still kind of am it's been about five years or no I shouldn't say I did a clown show at the at the Ottawa fringe two years ago 
um, with two of my characters, Joe and Susan, who I'm doing live this Sunday and next Thursday. <clears throat> but I think that two years ago, I went to Just for Laughs and I was very jealous of everyone that I saw doing stand-up comedy. Excuse me, I'm burping because I'm drinking Prosecco. <laughs> and my sister was like, be jealous of all of these people if they're if you're only doing stand-up but you're doing clown you're painting you're doing stand-up you're doing one woman shows like focus on stand-up and then see what happens and, and that was really a big uh career change last year for me because i really just focused on stand-up and i ended up getting a lot of really amazing stand-up opportunities and i think it came from like just deciding just don't do clown don't do art, like visual art, just focus on stand-up for one year, put it out to the universe that that's what you're working on and really focus on it. And I ended up, I thought, oh, I'm, I want to get into Just for Laughs. And it was like, it seemed like an insane dream, but I ended up getting in the Zoo Fest, which last year Zoo Fest and Just for Laughs were very connected. So I was actually on the Just for Laughs website and I got in for my ragbag cabaret and then they last minute called me and said, could I do a one woman outdoor show? One of my one woman shows. So I did Lady Rash. Don't Google it. <laughs> um, vaginal rashes come up and then me. Woohoo. But I, I ended up doing that show at Just for Laughs and I was like, okay, this is, this is great. Like, and now we're in effing quarantine. <laughs> so like a year after you kind of buckled down on stand up, like you kind of got your wish. Like it only took you a year basically. You know, it took me a year, but I've been in the business for so long. Like, I've been doing this for almost 25 years. I've been doing stand-up since the 90s with a break. But in total, my stand-up years are probably at about 18, 19 year, years of stand-up. And uh, so little has happened that I haven't worked hard for, honestly. Like, Howard has been wonderful this year to let me headline. And he sees my talent, and I appreciate that. And as you know, like, to get to advance in any of the clubs in Canada, you have to work so hard to convince people that you're good. Yeah. And I know a lot of people don't talk about this, but as a woman too, it is, it is, I think a little bit harder. Maybe, maybe that's controversial to say. <laughs> no, talk about it more. No, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I do think, I don't know. I just, I, I find at least, no, I'm, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't think I want to go there. Uh, okay, I think you're right, though. I think you're right. Uh, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> when did you find out, like, what was the first um, moment in your career where you were like, oh, I'm really good at comedy? Like, was there a certain show or something where you just left, like, where you were on top of the moon? Uh, I'm feeling like a bit of a coward not going on that topic. I, I just want just to, to sort of comment on it. I think... The reason I find it's a comp it's very difficult for women sometimes is I think I'm not necessarily a stereotypical woman, but I think the backbone you have to have for comedy and the willingness to deal with other people's bullshit, and I'm not saying men have an easier time dealing with that than women do, but I often find, like even when I think of when I started in the 90s, going into this dark basement on Bloor, up you know, in uh, Eglinton West and being most like almost the only woman and listening to men do like really awful jokes, sometimes about women to stay in that environment and say, I'm funny. I have a voice. I'm worth hearing. I think it's more challenging, especially when I started because there just weren't as many female voices. So it was difficult to see myself and see examples of me on stage I just saw a lot of guys doing dick jokes you know it's that's definitely changed the culture of the change but at in the 90s it was a really kind of greasy sort of you know going to these open mics like Einstein it was a place where you work out your stuff and I shouldn't say it hasn't even changed that much I did Toronto I did the whole circuit uh, for a good six years this is like 10 years ago or even less, and I was going out every night, and there was just so many awful gigs, and uh, there were just, it was so male-oriented, but I think that has definitely shift, shifted in the last five years, which is amazing, but uh, yeah, I, I just find in Canada, there's less female headliners than there are men, male headliners, but I know I think women make up 17% of 
stand-ups, apparently. So there's going to be less of us no matter what. 17? I, I, don't, I heard that number. I, I'm not sure if it's still true, but... <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Um, I, was, I was thinking, just doing this show, trying to think of like women headliners I know, so it's not just all men. And even there, like, like, whoa, there's not a lot that I know. Um, who are some of the, like, were there any like, like women headliners that you knew when you were coming up that like, you kind of saw as like, oh, it could be done? Or... Um, sadly, I can't, I can't remember when I started, uh, I know Joanna Downey was, you know, a lot of people like Kate Davis, Joanna Downey, they were just starting as well. So it was only when I had left stand-up comedy that their careers really started taking off and they became headliners at Yuck Yucks. So I didn't get to have them as role models. And then at that time, I, I honestly, I remember seeing Jeremy Hotz at Yuck Yucks and being incredibly inspired by him. And um, Corner Gas, um, the heck is his name? Brent Buck. Brent, Brent Buck, but Buck. Brent Buck. Seeing him and, and being blown away by him, but um, sadly it was mostly male comics at that time that I was inspired by. In the last 15 years, I've definitely found female mentors that I've adored watching and been inspired by. Um, but that's been mostly in the last 15 years. Who are some of like your favorite like headlining comics now? Um, I find because I listen to so much comedy on the radio, I've really gotten sick of so many of the people I adore. Like Amy Schumer, I really love. Nikki Glaser, Maria Bamford. There's, there's so many amazing female comics out there. But because I've listened to them so much, like even J uh, Jim Gaffigan, I, I used to love him. But... Now I don't want to listen to him. Like, I've just listened to his comedy way too much. So I'm, I'm a really big Mike Ward fan right now. And I've, I, I just have, it, I think it's because I'm starting to get into French comedy too. So I've been listening to more French comedy. But mm -hmm. I would say if you ask me who my favorite comics are, it changes pretty well every month because I tend to listen to someone too much and then I'm like done with them. Like songs, right? We do that with music. Uh, Nikki Glaser's special, uh, I think it was banging so so explicit like i think i paused it like three or four times I was, I was watching it alone and i was just like that is so graphic but it was so and she starts with it too and i'm always like people say i'm a dirty comic and i'm like are you kidding me <laughs> like she and even amy schumer like i've gotten to a point where i'm like can you talk about something else other than sex because even that's what i'm saying is working in some of the clubs, like club owners will be very explicit. I've been told, and I think this was great advice I got from a club owner who will remain nameless, to kind of make a third of your set about sex, but then make the other, the two thirds about something else, like something relatable to everyone that doesn't have anything to do with sex. But there's just certain things that if you're going with club preferences, they won't let you get away with that. But no one in the States is saying, Amy Schumer, can you tone down the sex material? But it's just, that's just the culture and the, you know, there's a star system in, uh, in the U.S. So it's different. In Canada, we have to kind of cater to the club sometimes um, because we, it's what the club owner wants, not necessarily because we're a star and we can do whatever the hell we want to do. I, I hate that. I think about that all the time. Like my favorite comedian in general is uh, is Chris Locke and he's Canadian. And when I think of all the American comedians, like I think he's so much, like he should have three Netflix specials. What are you doing, Canada? I know. I know. It's 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 we're we're very limited. And I think it's I look at Quebec and they have radio, they have TV and like several TV stations, several radio stations that bring in comedy. Like CBC puts on comedy, but if it's not clean, you're not going to hear it on CBC. I listen to French CBC and they say fuck all the time. Because it's in English, they don't care if you say fuck. That's crazy. It is. But you can't even say shit on CBC, I find. It, uh, it sucks. Um, Kyle, do you know Kyle Brownrigg? Yeah, very well. He did, um, remember his first gala on, on CBC, how, how clean it was. And I was just thinking, like, this isn't uh the real Kyle. I know. And my husband's always telling me, you should pride yourself in not being CBC material. 
constantly pitching myself to CBC and they, they, they don't care about me. CBC is so like sex and I'm a mother. Go ahead. Sorry. I just think CBC is really trying to appeal to too many people at once sometimes to be appealing at all. I take, I don't fully mean that, but I mean, I, at least in stand up, like I think it's too, but sorry, say that again. I got distracted. <laughs> Is the lighting good here? I feel uh, like I'm really in the dark. Am I in the dark? Um, no, no, I think you look fine. How about check out my lighting though? Um, Where are you getting, where's your light source? Like, I think I need a light source. Um, my dad's been telling me to get like a, like a selfie ring type. Thing. Like there's like all sorts of things you can do that my dad knows about for some reason. I want to meet your dad. He makes banana friggin, who buys banana liqueur? That's a unique. <laughs> Human being like that's like schnapps my dad is uh the best and i'll go he'll go toe for toe with any dad i think but that's for another conversation were your favorite uh like newer comedians um excluding me of course oh like in ottawa specifically what were you gonna say I think of people I've been listening to oh I, I'm so terrible at remembering names I hate those kind of questions because Everybody I does. Myself for that question. Newer comedians. Or just comedians that. Well, I like. I, for instance, Tavis. I think Tavis Mapleston is a. He's got quite the writer's brain and is an, He's he's he challenges himself in amazing ways, and he's newer to me. I mean, he's I I, I don't know how long he's been around. He's actually He'll crazy new for how because I think when I ask Ottawa comedians, he's almost always number one or number two, but he's only been doing stand-up steady for I think three or two years. Like it's insane. Really? It's something pretty brief considering. Um, there's some, there's a Quebec comedian, Christine Morancy too. She's, she's, I'm very fascinated by what she's doing. She's become famous very quickly. So I've been watching a lot of what she does. It, it's interesting because I'm wanting to get into French comedy all of these French comics are not new comics, but they're new comics to me. Like there's this woman, Catherine Levac, who's incredibly famous in Quebec. She's not new. She's been doing it for at least six years, but she's young. She's 29 years old and she's brand new to me because I never really paid attention to Quebec comedy. So I've been pretty fascinated with French comics, Quebec comics lately. Those have been kind of my new discoveries even francois bellefeuille he's someone that i've i've recently worked with and uh he's brand new to me because i only started really paying attention to french comedy two years ago Are you so ready? i should pay i i, I no I sh i'm not gonna should myself but i wish i had more new english names but i truly have been obsessed with uh with french comedy well i've got i want to talk more about french comedy but talk about uh no let's talk about french comedy I love Julie Dugan, and she's a friend, but she's a new comic, and I think she's doing some wonderful things. And I did the Ice Queens, and I did the Women's Day uh, show at Yuck Yucks, and I have to say, all of the comedians that were on both of those shows, you know, a lot of fabulous women, very strong, and uh, really working on their craft, and and uh, hustling to, to get, find their voices. And uh, I was very impressed on both those shows with all the up-and-coming comedians that are that are coming out of Ottawa. And you know you have a great open mic. There's so many fat. The Ottawa scene is amazing. It's very inspiring, and it's, I have to say, it's quite positive. And there's a real uh, nurturing environment that has been extremely inspiring coming out of Toronto, where I felt there was much more competition, a comp competitive edge, and I just didn't feel the support. I know a lot of people in Toronto probably do feel that support on the circuit, but I just never really felt it until I came to Ottawa. Is there a, like a venue in Ottawa? Like one of the little comedy rooms that's one of the little, I'm so condescending to my own shows. <laughs> but something like aside from Yucks or Abs, like one of, like what's your favorite room or one that you really miss doing now that you've had time to think? I love Christian's uh, room at the, at the Shanghai. restaurant at Shanghai. I find that's an adorable spot. Um, I also love Swizzles. Swizzles is sometimes, I've had horrible experiences there and I've had some mind blowing sets. I've often wanted to quit comedy after doing sets there. But then I I find hosting there is really fun. I remember a young comic said to me, he's like, I just don't like your comedy. He said that to me after a, 
a set. Who was it? Name. What's his name? Name you know his who, name. You know who it is. I'm not going to name his name. He who, knows who he is. Who's? I don't know who it is. It could be his mother, and I think that's it. It's like as if his mother was getting on stage and telling jokes. So I don't care about what 20-year-old comics think of me because they're not going to like what I do. Why would they? Female, female, 20, 20-year-old female comedians will probably appreciate what I do, but I remember getting reviewed in Edinburgh by a 22-year-old male comic, and I thought, this guy's not going to get what I'm doing. Some will. I don't want to stereotype about all young men because there are a lot of young men out there that do love what I'm doing, but there are some that will misunderstand uh, what I'm doing, and why would they understand that? Like, I, I wouldn't understand what they're doing either. We're in um, completely different worlds. I think you, I think it's really cool to see you at Swizzles and then, because I, I think I've seen you at Yucks more, but at Swizzles, you almost like, like you're not a different persona, but you, like you're a, like a chameleon, like you really check the vibe of the room and it's so different and cool. That's all, just a compliment. My room is survival mode. And because it's all, like it's such young people getting up and doing comedy and there's this real vibe and people will laugh at stuff and I'm like why did they just laugh at that that I have to figure out I remember recently I was there and I think it was Mitch the audience said show us your ass and he did and I was like dude you can't do that the audience wants you to do that but you're not allowed to give the audience what they want and I was going on right after him and I felt like I had to reestablish control and like check the audience and go you guys are not being responsible and people are letting you get away with shit so smarten the fuck up so i find that venue always challenges me to kind of make the room better and make the audience better because there's just so many bad habits the audience thinks they rule the the show there and it's often like you, you have to get them in check yeah and i think sometimes that place uh suffers from kind of trying to make like the back of the room laugh or sometimes it's just yeah. the behind the room yeah. but and that's the Toronto vibe that I'm used to, which is, and I used to try to make that back of the room laugh, and I realized I just can't. I can't. The only way I can is if I'm super stoned, and then probably I could, but it would be me making a fool of myself more than actually making people laugh. Yeah. Um, about you getting, like, there's a bunch of reviews on your shows. Is it, like, super uncomfortable to read reviews? Like, how antsy does it make you? I'd go insane. I used to really get on that bandwagon of uh, I do my opening night and then I read the reviews the next morning and if they're shitty, I'm depressed. If they're good, I think I'm amazing. Uh, one of my one woman shows was about that, about how I got like four and five star reviews and I was like, oh, those poor babies that got the one stars, they must be horrible shows. And then I got the one star. I did a, I did one show at the Edmonton Fringe back in the like early 2000s and I totally switched up the show. I made a bad decision. I did my Susan character at the beginning of this clown show where I'm a clown bitch diva excommunicated for bad behavior. I throw marshmallows at the audience. I lick people's heads. Long story short, I, I made a mistake and I bombed. The whole show bombed and there were five reviewers in the audience because I had had a very prestigious director direct my show and I got three one-star reviews, a bomb, and then a zero. And so I, I was ready to abandon what I was doing and just hated my work. So I kind of went on the roller coaster ride with that. And then a few years later, I did another show and started to realize how a quote that my dad used to always say is, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and meet those two imposters just the same, then you'll be a man, my son. And I'm like, I'm your daughter. But the gist of it is, it doesn't matter if they loved you. It doesn't matter if they hate you. You have to keep your head level because ultimately, for me, the thing I've learned is I know if they enjoyed it because laughter is the, the mess. Like if you hear the laughter, you know they liked it. And if you're delivering a show in an honest way, if it's a one-person show. So with the reviews, I've, I've definitely gone through whole show runs where I don't read reviews and I get people to read them for me and tell me if I should read them. The drag is if they say I shouldn't read them, I know they're probably kind of shitty. But I would say, like Edinburgh. Edinburgh, for instance, our first review was a three-star review. And it was a guy who was like, I told you, he was a stand-up comedian. I researched what he did because I was so pissed off by his review. I found out he's a 23-year-old comedian. 
And his take was, oh, skip the show and buy the CD. It's all about sex, and oh, this woman's obsessed with sex. And I was like, wow. Um, and then the night before we left, we got a, a four-star review from a very well-reputed uh, magazine, and she loved the show. And sure enough, it was a bit of a woman who was more my age. So it's like the shitty review could have totally destroyed my self-esteem and made me not believe in it if I gotten that amazing review I, I would have helped ticket sales ultimately now the way I look at reviews is reviews stop you from making money in your show like if you get a shitty review in the fringe you're gonna have to flyer your ass off or you're not gonna make any money because no one will come to your show if you get a great review you're gonna sell out your whole run and you won't have to flyer so it's for me it's just it's just a pain in the butt now when you get really bad press because someone didn't get the show or you had a shitty performance when they saw it, and it's gonna make you have to really work hard to to make money on the show. So but it doesn't really hurt your feelings if there's a bad review now. It's just more work. You know what? I have experienced so much rejection in this business. It's a huge part of I think what we do as comedians: apply for festivals every year, expect not to get in. Every once in a while you get in. Every once in a while you get an opportunity, but I feel like I have experienced just, I've had so many shitty reviews and I've had so many good reviews. There's no point in paying attention to any of them. Ultimately, I have to, my biggest lesson and takeaway from everything that I've ever done is I have to believe in myself. I have to believe in what I'm doing. There will always be people who hate what I'm doing and there will always be people who love what I'm doing. And the, the, the key is to focus on those people who love you and try to give them what they want or not what they want, but give them more of what they love. And the people who don't like you, I mean, what can you do, right? I mean, I know this very well-known uh, clown troupe, Mump and Smoot. They're horror clowns. They've taught me. They've directed me. They're amazing human beings. And one of, one of the guys said, there's always going to be people that hate what you do. There are always going to be those people. But what's the point in paying attention to those people? Oh, they're just going to take you down. And what we do is already very difficult. It's, 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 you're getting on stage and you're telling people what you think is funny. You have to have confidence and you have to believe in what you're saying because if you don't, no one else will and no one wants to listen to you, right? It's like, it's such a powerful act to get on stage and tell people you should listen to me. That's good advice. Well. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, this is a little random, but I'm on that website, uh, Gig Salad, and I saw that you're on it as well. I, in yeah. fact, uh, had somebody offer or ask if I wanted to do it, and they just mentioned your first name. It's like, uh, Rochelle will be there as if we all know each other. But like, Really? Oh, was this for that Ottawa gig? I, I don't know. I've never actually booked anything through it, because <laughs> the thing is, they always want somebody that can do like 40 minutes clean or something like that, and I, I could do six minutes amateur kind of gross. Oh, I, I, was, I was asked to do a gig in Mandarin recently. Like Man the language? And I'm like, where did you think on my website that I spoke Mandarin and I could do a religious ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> I they wanted you to do a religious thing? It was it was a religious ceremony and they wanted comedy that would be appropriate for a uh, Catholic Mandarin uh, group. <laughs> uh, I heard uh, one guy got asked to do like a funeral. Oh, really? What would you say like the weirdest one you was? Is it is it like the church, religious? Oh, the weirdest gig I've done. Yeah. Honestly, recently, and no offense to the person who booked me, I think she she was oh. still figuring it out. I was asked to do a Purim, which I only recently found out is a very religious Jewish ceremony, mostly for Orthodox Jewish people. Um, I was told there wouldn't be too many kids there. Maybe two. Three. There's about 25 kids at this thing. Everyone's sitting, kids running around, um, a band playing uh, traditional songs for a Purim. Anyone I told leading up to this were saying, why, why are you doing a Purim? It was, I wanted to, uh, someone was kind of taking a chance on me. She's a booker. And she was like, I really want to bring them comedy. I want to uh, let them see what I do and I really believe in what you're doing so can you do a bilingual set 
I knew when I got there it was going to be a disaster. And there was no light on stage, so you couldn't see me. Uh, there was a microphone, but no light. And there was about a 20-foot gap between me and the table. And there were kids running back and forth. And I do my joke where I say, <laughs> getting married is like making pancakes. Sometimes you have to throw the first one out. And this is like a group of orthodox people who do not believe in divorce and do not believe that divorce should even be spoken about. And no one laughed on that, except for like one guy at the back who seemed like he was drunk. And I was like, wow, this is going to be super shitty. And I think I was asked to do 15 minutes and I did 12 and I never do under my time, but I was like, I will not subject myself to any more of this. And when the kids were running back and forth and sitting on the stage and they were laughing and I was like, Holy shit, I should have been my clown. Like, they needed a clown. They needed a clown. So I didn't, I, I have so many shitty gig stories, but I didn't know I would have one this year. But that was this year. But uh, Would you say that is the shittiest or, like, all time, what's the shittiest? Um, like, shitty circumstances... It's a tricky one because that uh, th there's a story I tell in my in my show where um, I was a birthday clown and I was dressed as an elf and I was painting kids and they were all complaining because I did really bad face painting on their faces and then I had to throw up and I ended up throwing up in a parking lot and the kids were laughing at me and pigeons were eating my barf and it was a pretty horrible situation. Um, that was more of a clown, like back when I was experimenting with making $100 an hour doing face painting. Those were some, I did some pretty weird yeah. kind of, I used to do corporate comedy. So I remember doing a character at, a, at an event. It was the airport, the Vancouver airport was doing an opening. And I had been waitressing and just so sick of waitressing and doing shitty jobs. I wanted to do my art. And so I just said, you know what, for one week, I'm going to concentrate on my comedy career. And I was like working on my comedy, doing my characters. And I get a gig, 1300 bucks, to entertain people going onto an airport bus at the Vancouver airport. <laughs> so I was like playing Kathy's casting, dressed up like in weird jumper outfit. And I was like accosting people like, oh, you look like you should be in a film. Marlon Brando, who are you? And like talking to people, but someone called the police on me because they, <laughs> they actually thought I was a, a, a drag artist harassing people and they thought I was on drugs <laughs> and I had really bad fashion. <laughs> so that was really humiliating because I'm like, I'm hired entertainment and they thought that I was um, harassing people. You just smacked them in the face with your $1,300. Exactly. That is <laughs> really good money. But it was like you go to these weird corporate gigs where everyone's like eating bad food and you're supposed to be the life of the party. And I just like you have to do like a five hour shift where you're entertaining people for like 45 minutes. People are just walking around and you're the crazy person at the party making people laugh like just one on one. Oh, yes. I would go and hide in the change room and just be like, when is this going to end? I'm running out of jokes. I don't know what I'm doing. That sounds kind of terrible, but uh, like, so you're officially done with corporate stuff like that? Um, I've started doing corporate again, but more like I did a lot of corporate Christmas parties this year. And that, that was, you know, again, some of those can be hellish. Like you're suddenly at a party and there's no spotlight and it's a Christmas party and no one's ever seen comedy. And those have their own sort of hellish quality, but you're also also making pretty good money often. I mean, I think... It, the the money varies. I know a lot of people do corporate and make like several thousands of dollars. I've done a couple of those. Um, and those are really tough. I did one for a hospital event and it had to be clean. But I remember Jason from Absolute. He's given me some really good advice about corporates that you should always expect almost like 30%. I might be getting the numbers wrong, but like almost like 30% laughs or 50% less laughs than you would get in the club. Because people are working with call, they're working with their colleagues. 
they're out, but they don't want to laugh in case like, let's say I do a drug joke and then your neighbor laughs at it and you're like, oh, I guess you do drugs. So people are really hesitant. So I find one bit of advice that I've gotten from other people and that I'm starting to integrate is don't expect too much at corporate events. Like I did a falafel lunch for um, a government association this year and I was happy someone had said to me, this group doesn't, they don't laugh very easily. Like don't expect too many laughs because then you, you're not panicked for the whole time yeah. when they're not laughing, right? Uh, I could not relate. I'm panicked every time. <laughs> Um, okay, I have two. I have two hypothetical questions for you. Okay, and then okay. call it a day. Um, you could do no. If you were gonna do a comedy special, okay, let's say Crave TV. You seem like a Crave gal. What would you uh, call call your special? First? Oh well, I have it ready. It's Lady Rash. Don't Google it. That's good to go. It's my one hour stand up special, um, and it's it's not like my shit. I'm in love with you again. Show that's combining storytelling, music, comedy. It's my stand-up, like my just pure stand-up comedy that I've been working on for 15 years. So that would be it. It's Lady Rash. Don't Google it. Because if you do, nine vaginal rashes come up and then me, the only one with glitter. Woo! <laughs> my husband's an OBGYN, right? He, his, his specialty is Lady Rash. That's so funny. But aren't you worried, like, if you call it Lady Rash, because then some people, like, people will just have to Google Lady Rash to find you sometimes. Well, I have LadyRash.com and LadyRash.ca, so you will find me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the Lady Rash you're happy to see again. <laughs> Fuck, you've thought it out. Um, okay, what would be your, um, some specials they have, like, music that they walk out on stage to. Do you have an idea for that? I've asked my kids what I should walk out to, and they think I should come out to Pimp by, uh, is it LL Cool J? 50 Cent, like P-I-M-P? P-I-M-P. Like the singer. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Pimp. <laughs> dun, what to dun ba do Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Motherfucker, <laughs> I'll I can't remember how it goes, but Pimp. Yeah, yeah, I got it, okay. But I would come out, I have all these, like, I'm more into the schmaltzy, like, Kill the lights and touch my body. Da, da, da. Like kind of, a lot of times when I do my cabarets, I'll have uh, drag artists, and they often have like a lot of the artists I've worked with have fabulous taste in music, and I've often been inspired by their songs. Like there's a an artist called Kimmy, and she has this great song she did a dance to called uh, "Kill the Lights," and I love that song. It's just very empowering and very inspiring. Uh, okay. So for the for this special, if you could choose who's opening for you, would you pick a comedian or would you pick somebody like something a bit more like alt, not alt, but like like a clown or like like do some kind? Of not pick a clown. Sadly, I will. I put clowns in my cabarets for sure, but not not to open for me. Um, honestly, I think I would. I I I think I would pick a stand-up comedian. I I've done. I I did my own show in uh, Calabogie this year. Uh, the Rash Comedy Bash, and I'm actually doing it at Centerpoint in uh, February. And I've chosen, I, I'm putting myself as headliner, and I have, I think, five comics who are opening for me. So I, I personally think I would probably pick someone, ideally from Ottawa, or someone from Toronto or Montreal, but I would definitely pick a Canadian comedian because I think it's important to support local comedy. And I think, you know, I, I yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I would pick a comedian. I wouldn't pick something alt because I always have that idea. I've had burlesque performers open my show. Um, I've had magicians. I think when I'm doing stand-up, I want the audience warmed up mm -hmm. and ready to go. So, but it's hard to choose opening acts because I'm a really good opening act. I'm a good host. So it's it's tricky to find someone who can do that bullet spot. It's not an easy spot. Which five opening acts did you pick instead of me for your center point show? I I exist, Rochelle. Darling, of course you do. Uh who's in it? Jesse Reynolds is in it. Okay. Leonard Chan. Oh. Um, he's Toronto, but I, I like mixing it up a bit. Um, Jen, 
LaBelle is hosting. I had asked Rob Pugh, but I think he's busy. <laughs> um, and Crush Improv. So yes, that's a bit alternative. I love those guys. And I think what they're doing is interesting and it's comedic and I like mixing it up and I always like supporting other art forms. Yeah. So I like bringing in variety if I can. Okay, I'm no longer offended if those are your openers. I thought it was gonna be like David Haddad or something and I was gonna be real mad. Oh, David won't be happy that you just said that. <laughs> I love David Haddad. No, he'll be happy I said his name, I think. <laughs> you have to say it once every show, right? Yeah, it's a rule. <laughs> um, okay, this will be our final question. My final question. If you go on any any like dream comedy tour with uh, where you're hosting and you get like an opener and a feature act and a headliner, who would you pick, living or dead? Oh, living or dead? Yeah. All well, time. Richard Pryor, for sure. George Carlin, Richard Pryor. Uh, I'm sorry, they'd all be dead. <laughs> why would you not choose some? Why would you choose someone alive when you can have someone dead? I mean, I love a lot of alive comics, but if you can go into the dead and pick comics, uh. And Joan Rivers, that's it. That's my dream team right there. George Carlin, Joan Rivers, and Richard Pryor. Starting with them, there's a whole slew of other people we could pick, but I think that would be a good go on a boat cruise with those three. I'd learn a shitload about my craft. But, okay, so it's a great it's a great three, no doubt, but you got to choose, like, the hierarchy. Like, who's opening, and then who's, who's closing that? Who's the middle? Oh, what am I doing on the show? You're the MC. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, you, you made it. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I think we put Joan in the middle. We'd have to. Uh, I think the, the rule that yucks goes by, if it's a woman back-to-back, -back, the crowd will get confused. If you put two women in a row, they explode. Yeah. <laughs> the audience explodes. Two men in a row, nothing. But two women, people's um, anuses clench. <laughs> Another period joke, God damn it. So I think I would open with George Carlin, middle Joan Rivers, end with Richard Pryor. I'm sorry, because George Carlin would kind of, he's a little bit more intellectual, and we're going to lose our shit so hard with Richard Pryor. I mean, George Carlin, there's going to be some moments where we're not laughing. We're going to be thinking, and then Richard Pryor is just going to, and then Joan Rivers in the middle She's going to lambaste the audience. She's going to do a bit of a roast. And she's also going to, she's going to just open it up in such a way for Richard Pryor. Um, okay, so I understand this is a hypothetical question and it's, it's your show, but I don't know about, like just what you said about George Kern, like he's going to have people thinking and like that just seems like a risky spot for the opener where he's just like, Bleh. like what if he goes like on an intellectual tangent. In this hypothetical fantasy, he's not at the top of his game. I love that you're challenging my fantasy. <laughs> you're I the am only one. So clear. I'm so clear about the order, Andrew. I have no doubt that that is the perfect order. But the reason I'm doing that order is because if I had to, if I was on a boat and I had to kill one of those comedians, I would get rid of George Carlin first. And it would be very difficult to choose between Joan Rivers and Richard Pryor, but I probably would get rid of Joan Rivers, and I probably would get Richard Pryor saved. Sorry. Sorry. This, you really put me in a bit of a corner here. <laughs> That's what I do. Why Why'd you take it to a boat? I never said boat. You, you imagined a boat immediately. I always think of that because I'm like, if I was in a boat with my kids, my husband, and the dog, we ask ourselves this all the time. Who's going in the water first? Who, who, who loses that scenario? Who gets eaten first? Like, we have those conversations all the time. No doubt you're eating the dog first, right? It, it, it depends on the day. Some days the dog, it's, it's, it's kind of questionable. He's, he's adorable. I don't know where he is right now, but... I guess the dog doesn't leave the toilet seat up. It's a fun one. Yeah, I wanted the dog to be here for this. It's kind of why I invited you. I thought you'd bring the dog. Do we have a moment for me to grab my dog? Yeah, let's close on the dog. Is the dog coming? Oh, maybe he's gone. Time really flies, eh? That's been, it's been fun. Thank you, it's been fun. Do you want to... I'm not wrapping up. If you want to keep talking, I'm okay with it. I love your little 
you, so why are you surprised that I put them all in a boat? Well, it's just, it came out of nowhere. Um, because I've, I've heard that like comedy on a boat notoriously is shitty. Like you're kind of stuck in there. Um, and I think if we were going to think a bit more, if I was going to think more analytically about being on a boat with them, George Carlin seems like he might have been insufferable. Uh, I think Richard Pryor was on and off like a, like had a drug addiction. Joan Rivers was mean. But see, I'm not, when I thought of the boat, first of all, if we were doing comedy, it's possible that we were on a cruise because you said we're touring. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that. It could just be a tour bus. But then you mentioned, uh, I, uh, the way I think of it is who's my favorite. A good way to figure out who your favorite person is in the world. Picture yourself on a boat. Someone's got to get kicked off the boat. You're, 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 you've been on a deserted island. You're on the boat. This is the end. You got to get rid of two people. That's a good way to know who you really love. So that's how I'm figuring out which comedian I prefer is by putting us all on a boat and deciding who's getting kicked off first. I mean, we could do that with auto comedians, right? Just saw who we really like. Sadly, I think I might get thrown off the boat quite early. I, that's my feeling. Um, well, let's do the exact same question, but with auto comedians then. Don't do that. <laughs> you do it, Andrew. You talk to me about all the comedians you work with and who you want to throw over the boat first. <laughs> well, first thing you should know is what I do. It's not work. It's, it's very amateur. Um. <laughs> you work. You've had some controversial work. Should we get into your controversial uh, contribution to the auto comedy scene? How you radicalized it and basically are somewhat responsible for the underground comedy scene <laughs> for better or for worse? Uh, which for me, I'd always say for better. I, I have actually thought in... Um, in quarantine like I want to be more I don't get in more with one of the clubs isn't that just a novel like now that I'm I've decided I'm ready to be in a, a club comic now like you have a choice but um but on that note are you are you able to like have you kind of mended mended things with uh since the pancake incident that is a touchy subject <laughs> uh but basically like no I actually I did a show in Kingston with uh I did a show. I was on the Wednesday Amateur Night, and uh, Faisal Butt was the headliner. You know him? Yes. Okay. He he heard my name, and he was like, "Whoa!" Like, like the absolute thing. And I was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "So, did you uh, did you ever apologize to Jason?" And I was just so sincere, like not in a dick way, but I was like, I was kind of expecting him to apologize to me. And he was just like, "Whoa! You must really think you're somebody." It's like, fuck. Uh, so I think. Um, and I just had to give it a lot of time, but I, I'd be ready to uh, apologize to him. I just never see him. Well, maybe you write a note. Maybe I invite him uh, to do my little webcam conversation. That would be good. Hold on just one sec, okay? Yeah, get the dog. Guys, is the dog around? Is the dog around? Guys, we're live here with Rochelle Ali. I wish I didn't say that stuff about Jason. You know, I actually don't like dogs. I'm a cat guy. If anybody knows I can get on that absolute. Come on. Come on. Andy, come here. Come here. Oh my god. What's a... Uh, him with a liver treat. <laughs> What's a... Uh, is that a boy or girl? This is a boy. His name is Bandit. Hi, Bandit. And now he's kind of taking up the couch. Dogs have no spatial awareness. And now he's gone. No, I have uh, two kittens. Oh, and really? Kittens? Kittens. I'm more of a cat guy, for sure. But little, little, like just babies? Uh, well, I guess one's a baby, one's a full-grown woman. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we actually thought he was, uh, we thought our kitten was a girl that we brought him to a vet. He was like, it's a boy. And then he just kept, he, blow, he blew. He was like, look how tiny his testicles are. It was so humiliating. <laughs> Too much banana friggin' liqueur at your house. <laughs> Dad's making cocktails and doesn't know the gender of his kids or his cat. <laughs> he has a rough idea of what I am by now. <laughs> that is funny. So you were going to talk about the comedians in Ottawa and the boat. Okay, yes. We'll go on a boat. Um... So if I had to go and I'm hosting, which I would rather not host, actually. Um, no, no, but you're hosting. You are the host of the 
I, I won't say what the show was called. Yes, go ahead. Um, and if we're talking Ottawa, in that case, I'd have uh, Ben Ben Hoggle would be the opener. Yes. Uh, a very alienating guy on stage. Um, but he's fun. He's you know what? All, all of us have seen him annihilate. He's just he's so young, right? And he's 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 figuring it out. And he 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 also got he was so good right off the bat and then he had to just eat some humble pie for a bit but he's he's so talented it's funny because he's he's not even that young anymore um no but he's I, 19 to everyone always, <laughs> always will be <laughs> but that's no he he messages me once a day telling me he fucks so i'm, I'm sure he does oh, I know he's not a virgin but i'm saying like it's just he he's that persona right yeah he uh He's the only person I book on a show knowing full well he might just alienate everybody, but thinking like it's still gonna be funny to see. That's awesome. Um, but I think Ben and Laura. Mm. Um, Again, she's amazing. She's like very unpredictable and such a hard worker with writing. Like she challenges herself. She takes risks. She's she's really uh, risky and a hard worker. Also, we all got banned from from Absolute together. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay. so I feel responsible for, because I kind of caused them to get banned. <laughs> so, you guys can go on my boat tour. This, uh, is boat. this is the pity boat? I also think they're uh, they're great. But Ben's kind of fucked. He doesn't try as hard anymore, and I hope he sees this. He won't. He won't. If you just say people's names, it means they watch it? <laughs> That's good. We should mention as many people's names as possible. I think... Okay, uh, third. I have no idea. I'm having a hard time. Um, I yeah, I'm finally realizing what I've been doing to everybody. Would you first person to ask you who would be on your list? Oh, yeah. No. All of my guests have been very inconsiderate. Really? I, have I been considerate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're the only person to ask me. You shared it. It's nice. Um, have you seen Adin Javed? Seen? Aiden Javed. Aiden Javed. She's like a Pakistani, like relatively new. Yes, I have. I think I've seen her, um, but I am, you know, I, I know I've met her. I don't know if I've actually seen her comedy. Okay, well, she, we've become really good friends over quarantine, and uh, she's so funny, and uh, shit, she's a, uh, she can roast me really well. Nobody hurts my feelings. So I think her, and uh, I think I'd take myself out so David Haddad could host, because just in case he watches this, I can't, I can't not have him on my show, but. So I think David. To hear him on there. It's just I'm sick of his material. I'd have him, Ben, Laura, and Aiden. And uh, see, I didn't pick any professional comedians. But who are you gonna throw off the boat first? Laura. <laughs> <laughs> no question. Laura's so funny, but when you're that quirky and that funny, it's it always teeters on being fucking annoying as hell. He has to die first. Okay, and. Then <laughs> goes second david's on till the end isn't he the more i think about it uh <laughs> i actually take that back i'm not because laura's a vegetarian um so i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep laura vegan and i think aiden's vegetarian so i'm keeping them as long as i can because they're not gonna eat the meat oh my god that's a good point they won't eat you they won't eat me. And so in that case, uh, no disrespect to Haddad, but he is the fattest of them. Uh, <laughs> He's not fat. <laughs> that's a little... You're yeah. right. And he'd kick you off that boat too, or eat you. I don't know. I, I think I might be responsible for where this conversation went. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's definitely not my idea. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Anything you want to say to whoever's watching? I have no idea. Well, it's great that people are watching this. And I think it's wonderful, too. I think you've inspired people because you, you've, you've done something very creative over quarantine. And you've decided to do something very active, proactive, and you want to learn from people. I think that's wonderful. I mean, it's just you, you have that spirit of wanting to learn. And I think that that's amazing. It's very inspiring. I've been very inspired by what you've been doing. Thank you. Never be genuine to me again, though. It's uncomfortable. Really? <laughs> You're like, stop mothering me. 
I just never, never had one. On that note. You don't have a mother? No, famously I have no mom. Really? Test two, baby. That's not true. No. Uh, you're making funnier, that up. Funnier than the truth. Okay. Does your mom make cocktails too? My mom's dead. Oh, she is. When did she die? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> I now, aren't you, Andrew? <laughs> no, I want to hear about your mom. I didn't know you didn't have a mom. I don't want to talk about it. Your mom died. Oh my God! Like twenty. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this on Facebook Live. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> God damn it, Rochelle. Wedding, and we'll talk about it privately sometime. Hey, is your website still crowningmonkey.com? It is. And can I do a couple little shout outs, or not shout outs, but plugs? Yeah. Yeah, you plug it. Go away. I mean, go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to attempt to do uh, Facebook Live myself on Sunday. My character, Joe, who I did for eight years, uh, it's a character, Toothless Chubby Man. He's coming out of his suitcase in the basement, and he's going to be interviewing some really interesting people. Some guy who built a go-kart, a kid who writes, and this intermittent faster. Uh, Joe's porked out a bit during quarantine, so he's going to interview um, a young woman about intermittent fasting. It's going to be fun. Uh, and then Susan next Thursday is going to be doing some psychic readings and teaching people about how to love people in quarantine, how to how to work out problems. So those are happening Facebook Live. I think around eight o'clock on Facebook Live. Do you have like Facebook events open for those already? Because I could put them in the comments of this. I'm going to open them. Uh, I will do that tonight. I basically I have my Rochelle Ellie fan page where a lot of my events are, and I have a Joe fan page. Most of this will be at the Joe fan page. And I'm going to be doing my shit. I'm in love with you again. Show a bilingual version of it, in from two week two weeks from Saturday. It's called Shit Je T'aime Again, and it's going to be a bilingual version of my one woman show that I've done for five years. So check that out. And uh, my website's Crowning Monkey, and I'm book I'm Rash Ellie. Thank you, and on Instagram and all that business. Crowning Monkey, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Do you use Twitter? Ninety subscribers i'd love a few more holy crap it's hard to get subscribers on youtube i'll i'll subscribe to you if you subscribe to me i will send me yours i will <laughs> that was like um, a i'll show you mine if you show me yours yeah <laughs> i'm sorry i asked you about your mother i'm i'm sort of blushing and sweating at the same time uh well now so am i Oof. <laughs> um finish okay. your cocktail at least never Oh my God, you have a lot left. Have you had banana liqueur? It's tart. Oh. Okay. Um, I love you. I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. Great to chat with you. And thanks for having me on the show. Anytime. I'm just kidding. Yearly. Annually. Goodbye. Bye.